The Bible is an amazing book. In fact, it's not just one book. It's a collection of 66 individual books. Some of those books are books that contain law. Some are books of poetry. Some are books of prophecy. Some are books of history, and some are letters. Overall, there are 39 books that make up an Old Testament and 27 books that make up a New Testament. The Bible was authored by more than 40 men with varying backgrounds, educations, and nationalities. And these 40-plus men wrote in three different languages. The Old Testament was primarily written in the Hebrew language, with a small portion written in Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek. And these authors wrote over a period of time of about 1,500-plus years. As you reflect on these basic facts about the Bible, you should consider the perfect harmony that's found within these 66 books. There is no error or discrepancy that is to be found within their pages. Each one of these 66 books of the Bible contribute to the big picture of the Bible's story or theme. This main theme is the way of salvation. Certainly no man-made book could accomplish this tremendous feat. This must be the work of God. A man-made story that would be written over 1,500 years by more, than fi uh, by more than 40 different authors of varying backgrounds in three different languages would certainly have many different twists in theme and purpose and would contain many errors. Therefore, these basic facts about the Bible are among the greatest pieces of evidence that the Bible is not a man-made book. Instead, it is a book that comes from God, as 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 claims. If we're to understand this amazing book that contains the perfect revelation of God's will to mankind, we must understand its overall theme. This theme, as I mentioned, the way of salvation, can be summarized by the word gospel. This word simply means good news. The message of the Bible contains the most wonderful news mankind has ever heard about the opportunity to be saved. However, if there's an opportunity to be saved, it also means that there is something man must do to take advantage of that opportunity. And if there's an opportunity for man to be saved, it also implies that there is something man needed to be saved from. Therefore, let's open the pages of the Bible and discover the basics about this wonderful way of salvation. In Acts 16 and verse 17, some were identified as proclaiming the way of salvation to the people. We all need to learn this way of salvation as, as the message of the Bible is applicable to every person who lives on this earth. But as we begin studying the saving message of good news, let's also understand that there is only one true message of salvation, though man has often attempted to change it. Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9 says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. This one gospel is identified as the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes in Romans 1 and verse 16. And as we begin to study the way of salvation, we'll need to see the Bible story in three parts. First, we'll need to understand the problem of sin. Second, we'll need to understand God's part in salvation. And third, we'll need to understand man's part in salvation. Well, let's begin thinking about the way of salvation and going through this Bible story and begin 
at this point where we need to recognize the problem of sin. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1, verse 1. God is the creator of all things. When he created everything, he declared that it was very good, Genesis 1, verse 31. He placed the man in the garden of Eden that he had created, a true paradise on earth, and gave man full access to him. Read Genesis 1 and 2 to see more about God's creation and the home he had prepared for mankind. However, this would all soon change. As the man and the woman God had created in his image chose to sin against God. We need to recognize first that God is holy. God is eternal. He has no beginning and he has no end. He possesses limitless power as demonstrated in his ability to create all things there in Genesis chapter 1. He possesses complete and perfect knowledge of all things. He sees everything that happens. These are essential elements of what makes God, God. However, another key element to God that is essential to be understood is that God is holy. He is completely separated from everything that is evil. In Revelation 4, verses 6 through 8, it depicts a tremendous scene before the throne of God in heaven in which four marvelous spiritual beings are endlessly crying out to God, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then not only is God declared to be a holy God, but the scriptures also demonstrate what this means. In Psalm 5 and verse 4, it says, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. 1 John 1, verses 5 and 6 also states that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And therefore, since God is light and completely separated from the ways of darkness or evil, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, the holiness of God has far-reaching implications for how we, as the creation made in God's image, how we must respond. First, God's holiness is part of what makes him worthy of our praise, our love, and our devotion. You know, if God possessed all of the other characteristics, that he's eternal, he's all-seeing, he's all-knowing, and he's all-powerful, yet he was involved in evil, would you want to love him? Would you want to worship him? Would you want to devote your life to him? Second, God's holiness demands holiness from mankind. Look, for instance, in Leviticus 20 and verse 26. And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Or look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. In order for mankind to have a relationship with this God and enjoy the spiritual blessings that he provides, man must be holy. He must be separated from everything that is evil. And third, God's holiness involves both justice and love. Psalm 33 and verse 5 says, He who loves righteousness and justice, the earth is full of the goodness of God. God's justice means that he will always treat mankind fairly. It also means that whenever God makes any kind of promise, he will perform what he has promised. Sometimes this even involves the promise of punishment or penalty for those who do not obey him. Furthermore, his love always accompanies his justice. He is always looking out for our best interests, as a loving father always looks out and acts in the best interests of his children. Therefore, the holiness of God forms a solid foundation upon which we can build throughout the remainder of this study. Indeed, God's holiness has wide-reaching implications for how we live our lives. And as we'll see, God's holiness presents a great problem for mankind whenever we sin. 
But thanks be to God that His holiness has also provided mankind the opportunity to be saved from his sin. Now, as I mentioned moments ago, when God created all things on this earth, as recorded in Genesis chapter 1, he also chose to create mankind in a special way. In Genesis chapter 1, in verses 26 and 27, it explains, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Surely, since God is not a physical being, this cannot and does not mean that God has created mankind with a, with a physical resemblance to him. Instead, there's, much, there's a much greater point that's being made than just a point about a physical resemblance. In John 4, in verse 24, Jesus declared that God is spirit. Therefore, whenever mankind is created in the image of God, it means that mankind has been created to possess a spiritual element to his existence, a soul. Man, therefore, is not just flesh and bones, unlike the animals. He has the ability, by possessing a soul, to be in fellowship with and worship and serve the Almighty and Holy God. And then the scriptures also teach that this soul survives physical death. For instance, in Luke 23 and verse 43, Jesus told one of the two thieves who was being crucified alongside him, Today you will be with me in paradise. Physically, they were both going to experience death. However, Jesus' statement indicates that there is a continual existence for the soul after death, as you can compare in Acts 2 and verse 31. Also, as you consider the way in which God created mankind, it's important to realize that God created man with the ability to choose between right and wrong. God did not want to create someone who would worship and serve him because he had no other choice. Instead, God wanted the man he had created with a spiritual existence to choose to worship and serve his holy creator. This free will God created man with can be seen throughout the pages of Scripture as man makes many decisions, either to glorify God or not to glorify God. In fact, this is the reason God has created mankind and created him in his image. Isaiah 43 and verse 7, for instance, states, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. The book of Ecclesiastes, therefore, says that the entire purpose of man and living on this earth can be summarized in the following way. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Whenever God first created mankind in his own image, when he created the first man and the first woman, he placed them in the Garden of Eden, as you can see in Genesis chapter 2. And though we only have a very limited amount of information about this wonderful place and the original condition of man, Genesis 1 through 3 pictures mankind at that time as to have been enjoying the blessings of living in a true paradise on earth and full fellowship with his holy God. In the Garden of Eden, God gave man one law to live by. This was the law not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as you can see in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. And God promised them that they would die in the day they ate of this tree. And then in Genesis chapter 3, the scriptures record the evil influence of Satan who took the form of a serpent to lure or tempt mankind away from listening to God. As you can see throughout verses 1 through 6 of Genesis 3, Satan asked the woman, Eve, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? However, whenever Eve accurately stated God's law and the promised consequence for breaking the law, Satan did not stop. Instead, he said, you will not 
surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, Eve was faced with a choice. She could either exercise her free will to obey the voice of God, or she could listen to Satan. Verse 6 records her decision. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. But was God bluffing whenever he promised that they would die in the day they ate of the tree? Would there be any consequences for violating the law of God? The rest of Genesis 3 demonstrates that there were severe consequences for breaking God's laws. These consequences can be divided into two categories, physical and spiritual consequences. First, there were physical consequences for breaking God's law. Genesis 3 verses 16 through 24 details these consequences. There would be pain in childbearing for the woman. There would be hardship in the man's work. And they were cast out of the paradise that was the Garden of Eden, in which was the tree of life that would have allowed them to live forever. And then Genesis chapter 5 and verse 5 records the physical death of Adam. Yet these physical consequences were only part of the negative effects of sin. Remember that God promised Adam and Eve that they would die in the day they ate of the tree. Yet Adam did not die physically until many years after this took place. There was another kind of death they experienced in the day they ate of the forbidden tree. This was a spiritual death. Whenever Adam and Eve sinned, their wonderful relationship with their holy creator changed. They were separated from him. But why does Adam and Eve's sin matter so much? It matters because this was the first time man sinned against his holy God. It matters because this changed the entire course of this world. It matters because we all sin, just as Adam and Eve sinned. Therefore, we profit greatly from a study of their sin and their consequences of sin because it helps us understand our own sin and the consequences of that sin. You see, sin did not stop with Adam and Eve. As the Bible story continues, we see mankind continuing to sin against his holy creator. Cain was envious of his brother Abel and killed him. Mankind became so wicked during the days of Noah that God wanted to destroy him from the earth. And so it continues throughout the Bible. Even the nation of Israel, who was chosen as God's own special people, even they often sinned against God. The Bible simply teaches that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, verse 23. This includes me. This includes you. Everyone who has ever reached the point of personal moral accountability, having the ability to know right from wrong, has chosen to sin against God with only one exception, which we'll talk about later in the lesson. Now, please note that some, and I'm talking about infants and young children and and such, do not possess the mental ability to sin. But what exactly is sin anyways? The Bible defines sin in the following ways. First, sin is lawlessness. 1 John 3 and verse 4 says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin is acting against or contrary to the law God has revealed. Second, sin is unrighteousness. 1 John 5 and verse 17 says that all unrighteousness is sin. Sin is contrary to the righteous and holy ways of God. And third, sin is failing to do what God instructs. James 4 verse 17 says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. When God commands that you do something and you choose not to do it, you commit sin. To sin is to miss the target or to miss the mark that God has set for your life. It's like an archer who misses his target with his arrow. To sin is to fail to do what God instructs to be done or to do what God instructs not to be done. Therefore, anytime you violate the law that God has revealed to you in the pages of the Bible, you sin. Just like Adam and Eve sinned whenever they violated the law, that God had given them to live by. And just like Adam and Eve, you sin 
when, through the influence of Satan, you are lured away and enticed by your own physical desires and choose to fulfill those physical desires in unlawful ways, as you can see in James 1, verses 13 through 15. Now remember that God is a holy God and that sin is unrighteousness. Therefore, just as Adam and Eve experience, sin always carries consequences. And just as Adam and Eve experienced, these consequences can be divided into two categories, physical and spiritual consequences. First, sin has physical consequences. Physical death continues to exist in this world and, has, and spreads to all men as the result of the first sin, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22. Ever since the sin that occurred in the Garden of Eden, Mankind has been separated from the tree of life and no longer lives in a paradise on this earth. Passages like Hebrews 9 and verse 27 identify that physical death is a certainty for us all. However, physical death is not the only physical consequence of sin. Sometimes the sin we commit results in physical injury, jail time, the destruction of earthly relationships, etc., Second, sin has spiritual consequences. And the spiritual consequences of sin are the most damaging consequences of them all. Listen to Romans 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this verse is not referring to physical death. Physical death, as we just discussed, comes to everyone as the result of living in a fallen world. Rather, this, is, this death is a spiritual death. This is the same kind of death Adam and Eve experienced in the day they ate of the forbidden tree. This is a spiritual separation from God, the giver of all life, both physical and spiritual life. Also note that this death is what man earns. It's what he deserves. It is his wages for sinning against God. But why does sin result in spiritual death or separation from God? Remember that God is entirely holy. He is light and there is no darkness in him at all. Therefore, whenever we engage in unrighteousness, our holy God cannot remain in fellowship with us as we saw in Psalm 5 and verse 4 and 1 John 1 verses 5 and 6. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 summarizes this point. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Therefore, our sin destroys the relationship that we once experienced with our holy God. He cannot remain the God of light and be in fellowship with the ways of darkness. Like Adam and Eve, this separation from God is made the moment we sin. Thus the scriptures speak of the possibility of being dead while we live, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6, that is spiritually dead while we have physical life. Then the scriptures warn us that if we die physically while we're living in our sin, we will experience the vengeance of our holy God and be sentenced to everlasting punishment in hell fire. Consider 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9. This passage speaks of what will happen to some whenever Jesus Christ returns to end life on this earth. It says, In flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Notice that those who will be punished are those who do not know or obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who are living in sin. These individuals will experience the vengeance of God. And then notice that this punishment of everlasting destruction is from or away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Similarly, Jesus, in teaching about the great day of judgment that will take place when he comes, says that he will tell the wicked 
in Matthew 25 and in verse 41, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is everlasting separation from God and all the blessings he offers in the place that is called hell. Consider Revelation 21 and verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, this terrible news about sin gets even worse. Since we have all sinned and separated ourselves from God spiritually, we all deserve to experience this second death and hellfire for all of eternity. Remember, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, verse 23. It is what we've all earned. It's what we've deserved. And since this is what we've all earned and deserved, we are incapable of bridging the gap or the separation that has resulted between us and God because of our sins. The scriptures teach that we simply cannot do enough good works to make ourselves right in God's sight by ourselves. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Therefore, if this is all that we knew about the Bible, we would be hopelessly lost in our sins and would be doomed for everlasting punishment in hellfire. But that brings us to the second point in this study. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 15 says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. These are the wonderful and hope-filled words of the Apostle Paul. Fortunately, the amazing story of the Bible does not just tell us about the reality and consequences of sin, but it tells us of the way that God is made available to save mankind from his sins. Look at Romans 6 and verse 23 again. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, As we think about God's part in salvation, we need to recognize that God's justice demands life as a payment. God's holiness simply cannot permit him just to overlook sin without any price being paid. This would not be in harmony with his justice. When God pronounces a certain punishment for sin, that punishment must be paid. And as we've seen, the punishment for sin is death. Hebrews 9 verse 22 states this fundamental principle of truth. It says, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. While God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11 says, death is the cost of sin. Ezekiel 18 verse 20, for instance, states, the soul who sins shall die. The Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father bear the guilt of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Throughout the Scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, you can observe that this is the payment God requires for sin. It began in the Garden of Eden, continues today, and will continue for as long as life continues on this earth. Physical death exists because of sin and spiritual death results from sin. Man clearly needed to be saved. He could not save himself. He had doomed himself to everlasting destruction. Fortunately, God is an eternally wise God. Whenever Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God was not caught unprepared. He had a plan in place that would demonstrate his great love for his creation and pay the price that was owed by the sinner. The first glimpse into this plan of redemption is offered in Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 15, when God addresses Satan after Adam and Eve had sinned. He said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. There would be a time in the future when God would be victorious over the work of the devil. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 records another early reference to God's plan of salvation. And in this text, God promised Abraham that all families of the earth would be blessed through his lineage. These references are among many passages 
in the Old Testament that are evidence of the fact that God had a plan in place to redeem mankind from his sin. In fact, passages such as Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 8 through 11 and 1 Peter 1 verses 18 through 21 demonstrate that God had an eternal plan in place to redeem mankind from his sin even before he ever created the world and mankind. Now, temporarily, as clearly seen under the law God gave to govern the Israelite nation, known as the Law of Moses, God instructed people to make animal sacrifices in order to be forgiven of their sins. For this time, the life of the animal would be offered to pay the price that was due by the sinner. Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Under the law of Moses, a yearly animal sacrifice would be made on the day of atonement. Leviticus 16 verse 30 describes, For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you, to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Now, as you study the Old Testament and learn about its system of sacrifices, you learn some basic facts about this animal sacrifice. First, the animal was innocent of sin. This is because animals cannot sin. They are amoral. If they could sin, they would have been liable for their own sin. Sinlessness was a condition for paying the price due by the sinner, hence why the sinner could not save himself. Second, the animal had to be without defect, as you can see in Leviticus chapter 22, verses 20 through 21. And third, the sacrifice of the animal would demonstrate both God's justice and his mercy. The payment of life would still be required for sin. However, the one who had committed sin would be permitted to live. Fourth, Whenever this sacrifice was offered, the sins of the sinner were removed and he was restored or reconciled to a place of fellowship with his holy God, as you can see in Leviticus 4 and in verse 20. Still, even in this system of animal sacrifices that was in place to remove sin, there was a problem. Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 4 explains. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to have been offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Now, God did not lie when he said that those who offered these animal sacrifices would be forgiven of their sins. Remember, God is holy. He's separated from everything that's evil. And therefore, God does not lie. See Titus chapter 1, verse 2, and Hebrews 6, and verse 18. Instead, these sacrifices fulfilled their temporary purpose. But even in these sacrifices, it was not the blood of these animals that cleanses the people of their sins, ultimately, their sins would still be cleansed through the same sacrifice that our sins can be cleansed through today, as you can see in Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. You see, Jesus Christ is God's sacrificial lamb. John 3 and verse 16 proclaims, "For For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen to the proclamation of John the Baptist as he saw Jesus approaching him in John 1 and verse 29. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Throughout the Old Testament, such as in Genesis 3 and verse 15 and Genesis 12 and verse 3, as I referenced earlier, God promised that he would send the Messiah, the Christ, who would present himself as the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. Throughout the Old Testament, then, we watch the story of God's people and how the lineage was preserved through which God had promised to bring Jesus Christ into the world. And then in the books of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, Jesus Christ fulfills the Old Testament prophecies made concerning him and offers his own life 
as the ransom sacrifice for the sins of the world. Particularly, the end of each of these four books record the sufferings and death of Jesus Christ. You can, each, you can read each one of those records to see how Jesus Christ was betrayed, he was arrested, he was beaten, he was mocked, he was unfairly tried, spat upon, scourged, etc., leading up to his death. And then you can read about how Jesus Christ was taken to the place called Calvary and was hung on the cross, being fastened to it with nails driven through his hands and his feet. And there he died an agonizing death. Now consider some facts about Jesus' sacrifice. First, Jesus' death was intentional. Jesus did not have to come to the earth, suffer, and die. Instead, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9 indicates that Jesus chose to leave heaven, a place where there was no evil or suffering or death, and he chose to leave that so that we could become spiritually rich by living in heaven. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Second, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Jesus Christ was sinless, even though he was tempted just as we are, Hebrews 4 verse 15 says. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 and 19 says that we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 John 3 and verse 5 says, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whereas the blood of bulls and goats could not take away our sins, Jesus Christ offered himself one time and serves as a sacrifice of, for sins forevermore, as you can see in Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 14. Third, through Jesus' sacrifice, we can be saved from the wrath of God. Consider Romans chapter 5 and verses 8 through 11. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having, been, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Fourth, Jesus paid the price owed by the sinner. Because of our sins, we owed a debt that we could never repay. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Through Jesus' sacrifice, we can have the forgiveness of our sins and be restored to a place of fellowship with our holy God and have everlasting life in heaven when life on this earth is over. And fifth, Jesus' resurrection provides victory and furnishes proof that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus did not just die. He also rose from the dead by the power of God, as you can read about in Matthew chapter 28. And through his resurrection from the dead, God forever demonstrates that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God. You can see Acts 17, verse 31, and Romans 1, and verse 4. This life of Christ is key to our being victorious, as you can see in Romans 5, verses 8 through 11, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Without the resurrection of Christ, we would have no hope of a future resurrection from the dead. Now, in all of this, God has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. We had no way of bridging the separation between us and God that had resulted from our sins. Consider Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in the ages to come. 
that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we've now seen that Jesus Christ is the way to eternal salvation with God in heaven. In John 14 and verse 6, Jesus plainly stated, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yet although God has provided mankind with this bridge back to a state of being in fellowship with him, God has required man to cross that bridge. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ requires faith and obedience. This is man's part in salvation. The gospel of Jesus Christ details this wonderful opportunity God has given us to be saved from the consequences of our sins. However, he does not save everyone automatically. Remember, God created us as free moral agents and wants us each to choose to worship and serve him. Therefore, God has simply done for us what we could not do for ourselves in creating the bridge for us to be reconciled to him. However, he requires man to have faith and obey him in order to be saved. Look at Hebrews 5 and verse 9 carefully. It says, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus Christ has made eternal salvation in heaven possible, but it will only be given to those who obey him. For instance, even though Jesus died to save everyone, as we see in Titus 2 and verse 11, most people will, will be eternally condemned to hell fire because they'll not obey him, as you can see in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. In fact, Jesus even teaches that it's not enough just to believe in and profess him as Lord of your life, as you can see in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. You see, it's not just enough to believe that the bridge between us and God exists. Instead, true faith will trust in God so much that we'll do whatever he requires to cross the bridge. This is because true faith always responds in obedience, as you can see in Hebrews chapter 11. Noah trusted in God so much that he built the ark for the saving of his household. Abraham trusted in God so much that he sacrificed his son on the altar. And so it is today. Yes, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, according to Romans 1, verse 16. However, if you do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, you'll be punished with everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, as we saw in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9. But even though God requires our obedience to the gospel of Christ, as revealed in the pages of the New Testament, our obedience does not earn our salvation. Our obedience could never build the bridge, no matter how many good deeds we would do. Our obedience simply demonstrates our complete trust in God and crosses the bridge He has built. For instance, James 2 verse 24 says, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now consider with me the steps to salvation. Consider 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 14 and 15. It says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The one who died for you requires that you die with him. You die with Christ when you give your life to Christ by being obedient to the things he requires of you. So what exactly does God require you to do in order to have your sins forgiven and be saved? First, you must hear God's word. If you're going to be obedient to the gospel of Christ, you must first hear the gospel's message. Romans 10 verse 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You must hear about what God has done through Jesus Christ so that you can be saved and hear what he requires you to do in order to be saved. Second, you must believe. But without faith, it is impossible to, believe, to please him or please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
Hebrews 11, verse 6. Although mentally believing certain facts about God and Christ are not enough to be saved by themselves, God does require this mental assent. For instance, Jesus said in John 8, verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Third, you must repent of your sins. If you are going to die with Christ, you must put your old sins to death, as taught in Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, and Colossians 3. Repentance is central to this. In repentance, you determine to turn away from the sinful things you've previously been living for in order to, to live your life entirely for God. Acts 17, verse 30 says that God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Fourth, you must confess Jesus Christ. God requires that you confess Jesus Christ with your mouth. Romans 10, verse 9, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. An example of this confession is found over in Acts 8 and verse 37. When the Ethiopian, prior to being baptized, confessed, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And fifth, you must be baptized. To be baptized is to be immersed in water, as you can see in Acts 8 verses 38 and 39 and Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. This immersion in water is plainly said to be necessary for the sal salvation from sins. Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Also, Acts 2 and verse 38 records the command, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, upon being obedient to these required steps for salvation, we will be forgiven of our sins, reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, and be saved from the wrath we deserve to experience because of our sins. Furthermore, those who do what God requires for salvation are added to His church, that collection of the saved. Acts 2 and verse 47 records that those who obeyed this plan of salvation were added to the church by the Lord. This is the one church Jesus promised to establish, according to Matthew 16 and verse 18. And then after being forgiven of our sins and being added to Christ's church, we must remain faithful to God throughout our earthly lives. Jesus said in Revelation 2 and verse 10, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. This faithfulness involves doing everything God requires you to do as a Christian, as revealed throughout the pages of the New Testament. Therefore, you must devote yourself to diligently studying the Word of God so that you can live in a way that God approves. For it is possible to fall from the grace of God after being saved by it, as you can see in Galatians 5 and in verse 4. Even after becoming Christians, we can sin and separate ourselves from God. And whenever we do, we must repent of that sin, confess the sin to God, and ask him for forgiveness, as you can see in Acts 8, verses 14 through 24, and 1 John 1, verses 8 through chapter 2 and verse 2. And after doing so, we'll, one, we'll be once again reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible records this amazing plan of salvation. It is truly the greatest news that we could ever hear. It is the story of salvation from our sins through Jesus Christ. However, we must be obedient to the requirements God has placed upon our salvation. Have you been obedient? Have you believed and obeyed God? If not, you'll experience the wrath and vengeance of God. But if you will believe and obey God, you will be forgiven of your sins. You'll be reconciled to God, and you will spend eternity in heaven. No other message will produce this eternal salvation. No other message will result in your being part of Jesus' one true church. Acts 4 verse 12 simply states, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved.